Please open your Bibles up to the book of Luke chapter 14. And as you're opening up your Bibles to Luke chapter 14, we are continuing our series of sermons called The Faith Chain, and we are on link number five. And what we're trying to do is, is teach not only us, but get prepared to teach others about the faith that leads to eternal life. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created mankind in his image. He took a rib from man, created woman as his helpmate. In the Garden of Eden, they were to tend and to till it. And guess what they did? They sinned against God by participating in something that they should not have participated in, bringing on then death of the flesh and death of the soul. God so loved the world, though, that he wanted to live with mankind forever. He wants to fellowship with us in the Garden of Eden type of setting. So he put together this plan to send his son to die on the cross as a perfect sacrifice to forgive the sins of mankind and that mankind can be resurrected on this special day to then live with him in heaven forever. That is a truth. The problem is, is that there are many people teaching many different things on how to get to heaven and in fellowship with Jesus, forgiven of the sins, washed with the blood. And what we want to do is teach what the truth is in God's word on how to get to heaven, how to be in fellowship with Jesus, how to have your sins washed by his blood. That's what this faith chain is all about. So what we need to understand is that it comes from, faith comes from hearing, hearing from the Word of God. The Bible is the source and resource. And as you read the Scriptures and study them, you have to study them in historical context, not theological context. You can't like think what you want the Bible to say and then study it out to find what the Bible says to match what you want. You have to study the Scriptures to find out what God actually says and then apply that to your life. Amen? So that's an imperative when you study the scriptures of faith, the true faith, the one that leads to eternal life and, and salvation through Christ comes from the scriptures. You have to study the scriptures as a history book and read what history says and apply what history teaches to us. Anything outside of that, you're not going to find the faith. And then we found that the next step then is, as you go along, as you hear about Jesus, you hear about the Bible, you have to start making some decisions. Do I really believe that to be true or not? Do I really want to believe? Do I have time in my life to even think more about the Bible or not? These are decisions that we need to make. And as you progress then in your hearing and as you progress in your understanding, then you need to start making some decisions. Well, what kind of relationship do I want to have with Christ? How much of him do I really want in my life? And as we talked about last week, unfortunately, what many people have bought into is the religious system type of relationship with Jesus. In other words, find the church of your choice, a good group of people, what, is, what are the doctrines that they teach about faith, and then the willingness to adhere to those doctrinal teachings, and then a desire to be a part of that particular group of people, and then you combine those two things together, and that equals then your relationship with Jesus, which really is, in fact, just a relationship with a religious system and a group of people who have bought into that same system. That type of relationship is not going to get you to heaven. So what we did last week then is took a little side trip and talked about how what Christ wants is a way of life. He wants us to have a family system, not just a religious organization system. He wants us to have the body system, the body of Christ, and for us to be a part of that system, not just a religious organization system. And that's where we left it off last week. This week, what I want to do is pick up in this idea of loving Jesus and trusting him and getting to a point where you either decide to give your life to him or not his way. Here's what I'm afraid of. In Luke chapter 18, we won't go there, but last week I referred to it. It's the rich young ruler where Jesus was asked the question by him, well, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus says, we have to do the things in the Ten Commandments. And the, the rich young ruler said, well, that's what I am doing. I'm doing these things. I guess I'm in. And Jesus says, no, there's one more thing you need to do. You need to sell all your possessions and follow me. Now, the rich young ruler then processed that, and he went and he thought, no, I can't because I have so much stuff. That the rich young ruler really relied on himself, he didn't rely on God. He relied on himself for guidance, he didn't rely on the word of God. He relied on himself and his possessions to give him security in life, 
not on God and Jesus. And so the rich young ruler chose not to follow Christ because he was brought to the place where he had to choose between his stuff and Jesus. Church, that's where we're at in this chain right now, in this idea of who are you going to choose? And, and you can't just sort of choose. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, there's this congregation that is filled with people who, when they came to Christ and they gave their life to Jesus, they only kind of gave it to him. They still wanted to hold on to their old life and their old self, but they still wanted to have enough of Jesus to be a follower of Jesus. At least that's what they thought they would be. And Christ looks at their life and says, oh, you make me sick because you're just lukewarm. You've got one foot in the world and one foot in my kingdom, and that just doesn't work. And it doesn't work today. Jesus wants followers, not visitors. But please hear me out. It takes visitation to become a follower. You don't automatically get introduced to some sermon, one sermon, one person, one word, and all of a sudden go, well, that's it. My whole life I want to dedicate to Jesus. It doesn't work that, like that because you can't dedicate yourself and be a follower of somebody if you really don't know who they are and where they're going. You can't be a follower of Jesus if you don't know who he is or where he's going or what he's about and what he wants you to do. It takes a follower to find those things out, but it begins by making the decision, do I want to follow him or not? Not kind of, but all the way. And it takes visits with Christ to get to that point where you're invited to a Sunday service. Perhaps this is your first time here. And maybe this is the first time you're hearing things like this and you're going, well, that's intriguing about the garden and about sin and about Jesus and plan of salvation. I know he just sort of highlighted it really quickly, but boy, that's intriguing to me. And yeah, I've heard about heaven and I kind of believe in that. I sure want to learn more. Man, that's a good visit now, isn't it? Because then that leads somebody to want to know more. But I'm afraid that many of us have gotten trapped into the system where we think we know enough and we just give enough when we really don't follow him much at all. So what I want us to do is to see this, to, to help us out, to know that it's okay to be a seeker. It's okay to be visiting right now and to try to figure out and find out who Jesus is. But you have to go to his book to find it. You have to process it through your mind and heart to decide whether you believe it or not. And if you're struggling with your belief, you need to go back into study more to figure out whether you believe it or not. And if you believe these things to be true about Jesus and creation and God and who we are and where we're at in his plan, when you get to that place, then you need to to continue to make decisions of how much of your life do you really want to give to Christ? Because anything short of all will fall short of heaven. Now I know some people hear this and they think, well, Tad, that's a doggy downer lesson. That it almost sounds depressing. <laughs> Being a follower of Christ is not depressing. Matter of fact, it's so beautiful that when you actually finally do it, it's amazing how much you get. And I want to get there first, but it's that emptying that we need to see. Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 16, Jesus teaches this parable of the dinner. Luke 14, verse 16 reads, But Jesus said to him, A certain man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. Man, this sounds cool, doesn't it? I mean, we've got this guy who's put on this big feast, and not only has he invited them already so that they know about it, he does this reminder. I like reminders because sometimes I forget. So he sends out this servant. He says, Hey, listen, go out and remind everybody. Party started. It's all ready. Well, let's see what they say. Verse 7, 18. But they, all alike, began to make excuses. Uh-oh. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for all the work. Thanks for all the preparation. Thanks for everything that you've invested. 
when you have invited me and you had thought that I would be there, so you've made enough for my portion, but I'm going to be excused because i got to go check my stuff out. Well, let's see who's next. Verse 19. And another one said, well, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. In our modern day, I just bought a brand new tractor. I'd like to see how it tills the land. Or bought this brand new hot rod. I'd like to see how she runs. Please consider me excused because I want to do these things for me. Verse 20. And another one said, I have married a wife. Oh boy. And for that reason, I cannot come. Now, I'm not going to speculate here, okay, but my mind is really turning on this one. But you can see at least with that, when you bind yourself to another person in holy matrimony, when you say I do to somebody, you yoke yourself to them, they have a huge influence on how you see things, how you do things, when you do things, and why you do things. Amen? So here's this guy who has now this wife, and he's invited to this great celebration, but even he feels like he's excused because his marriage, in this case, is taking priority. Verse 21, And the slave came back and reported this to the master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring here the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is more room. Verse 23, And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my dinner. Now, I could park here for a long time. This is just the introduction. This is just that idea that when the Master Jesus invites people for a feast, and there are many different ways that you can apply this idea of feast, but when he invites you to come together, when he invites you to come and eat, when he invites you to come and participate, and you have all of these excuses as to why not, his response to that is, there's no way that they're going to eat with me. When that big dinner comes, when that final thing comes, don't plan on being there. You had your invitation. You came up with your excuses. You made your decision. You didn't want to follow me because of your land, because of your oxen, because of your wife, or whatever excuse you want to have, you decided to choose them over me. And so when it comes down to it, you're not going to get what I have to offer because you weren't there to get it. Now watch how this works into verse 25. Now great multitudes were going along with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he, say it with me, cannot be my disciple. Now last I checked, cannot means cannot. Now, Jesus is building on these teachings that he already had, this dinner thing, and people came up with all these excuses and reasons why not to show up. And then he turns right around and says, listen, you have to have that point, and when he talks about hate, he's not talking about the hate that we think of with hate, you know, that anger and bitterness and cast them aside type of idea. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about prioritizing. If you prioritize your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your husband and wife, even yourself over me, you can't be my disciple. There's there's only one head here, and that head is Jesus. And if you decide to place anything, including yourself, above that, you can't be my disciple. 
Now, I was going to go into a discourse on discipleship, and I decided to just do a real quick highlight, but somewhere down the road we'll do a deeper study in this. A disciple, a disciple is somebody who cognitively makes the decision and the sacrifice to remove his old life to sit at the feet of somebody he trusts to guide them through life. That the disciple has selected a teacher, and they trust that teacher and his teachings so much that they are going to be with that teacher until they learn about how to live life and then actually live it the way the teacher says. This is a training program that takes moment by moment, day by day, living and learning from the teacher. Now we could get into it a little bit further and show that this guy, whoever this guy or gal is who decides to become a disciple, places his full trust then in this person. So then they learn about marriage, they learn about children, they learn about life, they learn about spiritual things, they learn about history, they learn everything from the teacher. And then they learn how to apply those things to their own life. And when they get it down, they then go out and they make disciples. Of who? Of their teacher. Now you can see how you have to trust and love and believe in a teacher to such a great degree that you would be willing to say, that person is the way I want to live life in every measure of life. You can't do that half-hearted now, can you? That's a decision that is a life-changing decision where you now believe that this person's teaching is what life is supposed to be all about. And that the way that you used to think about marriage and children and work and spiritual things, the way you used to think those, they have all been discarded to be replaced by the teacher. Why? Because you are now the disciple. You can see how you have to remove your priority of parent. You have to remove the priority of children. You have to remove the priority of your spouse. You have to remove the priority even of yourself to make the room in your mind and heart for you to then learn and submit these, to these new things. Because they will at times clash. And that's this relationship with Jesus. That if you want to be a disciple of Christ, you have to be willing to empty yourself of all of these influences, all of these things. It doesn't mean you remove parents. It doesn't mean that you remove children. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden you become some sort of monk on a mountain in the middle of nowhere in some sort of room chanting chants and reading scripture. That's not what it's talking about. What's talking about is you remove those things as the priority and influence that Jesus and his teachings become top notch and that you focus on learning all there is to know about those things so that as you look to your mom and your dad and your children and your spouse, you're going to apply what he says to them. And now you're a disciple. But to do that, you see how much commitment you have to have to do that? It can't just be a visitor mentality. It, it can't be, well, if I go to church a couple times a month, if I go to Bible class on Wednesday night a couple times a month, that'll be enough. It won't be. Jason did a study with his kids that said that if you went to class on Sunday morning, Sunday worship, Sunday night, Wednesday night, from the time that they were in kindergarten until the time they graduated college age. That just with that amount of time in church, you'd graduate with a third grade education biblically. I don't know about that. Doesn't seem to me to be a disciple. And that's if you made it to every class on Sundays and Wednesdays. 
You see, what I'm afraid of is that many people have been taught that it's okay to show up every once in a while, this visitation mentality, and all you then get is these disconnected, you get these disconnected teachings, these disconnected stories, these disconnected thoughts about the Bible. And, and, and many times people show up to Bible class, particularly the adult Bible class, and some of the things that are taught in Bible class, adult class go right over their head because they don't have the foundation built up to understand what's on the roof. And so you have these good-hearted people who really want to come and they want to visit, but they don't have any foundation, any structure, because they're in this visitation program with Jesus. And so then they start to get frustrated and they lock down and then just kind of stay right where they're at. And the fault is not the church. The fault is not your parents. The fault is not the children. The fault is not your spouse. The fault lies within the hearts and minds of every single individual. You cannot and nor can I blame anybody else. It's our journey. It's our faith. It's our decision. And what we need to be made aware of is that Jesus wants us all to be disciples of His, to fill our minds and hearts with His teachings, and to fill our lives to act and live like He teaches us to act to live so that we can be the family of God, so that we can be His body on earth, to then show the world what He looks like through us. And the unfortunate thing is, is that, boy, dare I say it, I'm afraid that the church from time to time gives a really poor image of Jesus, misrepresenting what he really looks like. And I have the answer for the problem. It's because we're not disciples. We're just visitors. Now again, it's good to be a visitor so long as you're making progress and, and you don't give yourself wholly over to Jesus right away. It takes that, that I'm going to show up, I'm going to listen to what he has to say, and I'm going to pray a little bit more, and I'm going to read a little bit more, and I'm going to understand a little, I'm going to ask a few more questions because I'm not quite comprehending the historical context here, but I heard the preacher say that. So it's this journey of wanting to know a little bit more because to give your life wholly to Christ, you have to love him with all your heart and trust him with everything that you are to be a follower of Christ, and that takes takes a huge commitment, not part-time. So here we have now this verse 27. Luke chapter 14. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So we've gone from this prioritizing in the relationships that we have, including the relationships that we have with ourselves, to now having this idea of Jesus teaching what you need to do is carry the cross. The cross is an emblem of what? Of death. If you don't bear this, this, this idea of death to yourself and life through me, you can't be a disciple of mine. In other words, you're going to have to kill off the old self. You have to bury those old ideas and that old way of life and those old priorities and then come up and have a new life through me. Because when you do that, now we're on to something. Now you've opened up the room in your mind and your heart for me to fill it with truth and spirit and give you a new way of living life so that it accurately reflects a disciple of mine. We don't want disciples of the Sunset Church. We want disciples of Jesus. We don't want to have family members of the Sunset Church. We want to have family built upon the foundation of Christ where we are blood relatives, the blood of Christ, and, of course, physically tracing back to who we came from. We don't want to be a disconnected body at the Sunset Church. We want to be a unified body of Christ working together, knowing what our plan and our purpose is in serving Him, knowing where our place is. Am I a finger or a fingernail? Am I a toe or am I toe jam? Where do I fit in the body of Christ? So that we can work together as disciples in Him. But watch this now. Verse 28, for which of you, 
when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Now listen, that is a true statement. People start off and they say, man, I really want to give my life to Christ. I, I want him to be the foundation of my life. And I, I start that. I start visiting him. I start learning. I start building this foundation with he and Jesus. But then I get to a certain place where I realize that he wants more material from me. He wants more of me. And I didn't count that cost because that means sacrifice and time and effort and sweat. It takes a lot of work to build a house. And so some people get to that place where they see how much dedication it takes to be a disciple and to build the house with God as the head of your house. And folks just kind of stop in the middle. And guess what other people say? Oh, you started off really fast with that Jesus. Oh, you're really on fire at the early beginning. But you got to a point where you stopped. Look at you now. And you want to know who's in the lead of saying those things? His name is Satan. Because he wants to stop your progression. You see, you should have counted the cost. You should have recognized that when you begin this journey with Jesus, that he wants it all and not to stop short. Are you willing to do that? Are you and I willing to count the cost at what he wants us to give up so we can give it all to him? Now, if you're not willing to do that, then understand that and at least go, you know what, Tad, you're right. I just want to stay a visitor. Peace. but you won't make it to heaven. Only followers do. Only disciples do. And so it's important for us, and I want this to be, oh my word. I want this to be a challenge for us to evaluate what it is in our lives right now that we didn't plan on or count on giving up, but God is calling us to do that so that we can continue to be seekers and perhaps disciples of His. Are there relationships that you need to give up? Are there things? Is there a job that gets in the way? Or are there materials? Is it yourself, your attitudes, your perceptions? your likes and dislikes of things, your guilt, what is it? What is it that is getting in the way of you being a disciple of Christ? There's another section here, this verse 31, or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Again, this battle mentality now. We go from a house to now war. In church, it is war. The battle right now is over your soul. Satan is fighting to get you, and God has died for you. And he's been raised up for you. And what he wants us to do is now, let's count the cost. As I go out to battle with Jesus, the odds seem to be stacked against us, but am I equipped and prepared to win the battle anyway? Do you see how it takes preparation and work? You don't go into Christ and into discipleship and into the church and into these things without first recognizing that you need to be all in, at least in mentality, as you go in or you will be defeated and your house will fall. You don't have to be there right up front. But you have to take the process of faith from the Word of God, studying the Word of God, believing it, understanding it, and moving on to then decide how much of my life do I really want to give to Christ. And the answer from Him to us is, He wants it all. Or you can't be His disciple. All you'll be is a visitor. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Chris Kinsey, if I don't give this scripture, he might explode. In Luke chapter 9, deny yourself, 
pick up your cross and follow me. Jesus is not playing around with this concept, church. This isn't one of those, well, maybe I can squeeze in. It is one of those, you cannot be a disciple of mine. You cannot be, you cannot, you cannot be a disciple of mine unless you prioritize your relationships with me first, including the relationship that you have with yourself. You cannot be a disciple of mine unless you prioritize your possessions in the right order, where they all belong to me, not you anymore. You have to be willing to kill your old self off so that it opens up me recreating you to be like me. Next week, what we're going to do is look at the faith response Jesus teaches to have that moment of decision where you decide to give your life to Christ and you will be born again. Now, we usually look at that as a new birth, as in now I've been washed clean, the old self's dead, and now I'm alive for and through Christ. And those are true statements. But in this concept of this idea that we're learning today about discipleship, you and I need to come to that very adult, very life-changing decision, knowing that it's this much on the line, that if we really do want to have Jesus, we do have to bury our old self. It's that kind of deal, that that old life that we're living right now is going to be lifted up and all new and all focused on Jesus. Not perfect, but brand new focus, brand new life all on Jesus. I'll give this illustration as we start closing. Many years ago, I married my wife. She finally said, I do. Lucky woman. <laughs> we are so much different now, 30, almost 32 later, years later, having met. But when we first said I do to each other on that altar, I knew what I was getting into. I knew that when I said I do to her, it meant death tell us part. And I knew that I didn't know everything about her and she didn't know everything about me. But what I did know is that whatever it is that we learn about each other, we're going to do it together. And that I was signing up for a journey of a life change. That part of Tad Masteller died the day I went to the altar and said I do to my wife to make room for my wife to become part of me. There couldn't be all Tad saying I do to Libby and have Libby then conform to all Tad. That's not a marriage. That's a dictatorship. What I needed to do is recognize that my life is not complete without her, so I need to empty myself to let her come in and tie in with me. And as we grow through life together, as I learn more about her, I can be more of what she wants me to be, and she'll be more of what I need her to be, so the two of us can be one and continue to be in love. And I've had to make sacrifices, and oh, has she had to make sacrifices for me. But we do it because when we said I do, we knew what we were getting into. Church, it's that kind of decision with Jesus. It's not this, well, I'll go through the steps and I'll get baptized and I'll be added to the church and figure it out later. You need to figure out enough now to count the cost and know what it means to die to self and live for Jesus. My lovely wife was baptized, and I don't mean this as literally immersed into Christ, but she went through the act of baptism when she was 14 years old because her best friend next to her nudged her and said, now's the time we do this in the church of Christ. So she got up and she went. Now, for many years after that, my wife served diligently in the church. She taught, and she's a great servant, but she came to a conclusion many years after her first baptism that she really didn't give her life wholly to Christ that day. That she didn't empty herself and start anew. That she didn't make Him the Lord, I mean absolute Lord, of her life at that time. So then she wasn't rebaptized. She was baptized for the very first time into Christ by having her old self truly be buried and then receiving Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And from that moment on for her, and from that moment on for me, when I went through my own immersion into Christ, I have continued to pursue Jesus as his disciple, as imperfect as I am. But when I mess up, I recognize it eventually, and I ask for forgiveness because I don't want to lose contact with my Savior, my Lord, my guide, my teacher, my groom, Jesus Christ. And so I progress as a disciple. 
because I understood the commitment I made to him when I died to myself. So church, as we get into next week's study, it's a great time to take notes because this is where many church organizations divide over how to actually give your life over to Christ. This morning, I'm asking you to do it. You have to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, immersed into a tomb and bury your old self. It's the way he teaches. And if you have not done that yet, please, if you want to give your life to Christ, not just as a, well, it's just a little quick response, but truly as giving your life wholly over to him where he will be the guide to everything in life, boy, we sure would be excited to help you. And if you are a member of the Lord's Church today and you are recognizing that you have just been in this recent funk of visitation and that you have lost step as a follower and that you have not been sitting at the feet of Jesus as a disciple, then we ask you, if you would wish to do so, come forward and ask for help, ask for forgiveness, and we will help you be reconnected to your King and mine, Jesus as we stand and sing the song of invitation.